Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so let's start. Um, we're really happy to have Danushka Bolegla from the uh, University of Tokyo. Uh, he's on the way back from uh, Triple W in, in the, uh, the East Coast the last week. And um, uh, the, his talk is going to be um, basically the same as what he presented there. Um, this is a topic that a lot of us are interested in across groups, and hopefully this will, um, again, stimulate the discussion among ourselves as well. Um, Danushka's uh, relationship to Microsoft is kind of interesting that he uh, worked for Fast Japan for four years as an intern while he was a PhD student. So he knows a lot about what's going on in Microsoft uh, Japan, probably better than I do. Um, and Fast, uh, I think Fast's biggest customer in the world before they got bought by Microsoft was in Japan uh, by a, a company called Lactin, and they have like huge amount of queries. They have like, I've heard they have more than 20,000 clicks per second on average. They're like Amazon type of place in, in Japan. So I think that's partially why he's doing all this research, um, was mo motivated by uh, looking at a lot of stuff that Fast was doing in Japan anyway. Um, so let's uh, welcome Danushka and uh, hear about um, relational duality work that he's done. Yes, uh, my name is Danushka. Uh, I work at the University of Tokyo, and I'll be presenting uh, my work on relational duality, uh, unsupervised extraction of uh, semantic relations between entities. And this is a talk that I gave last week uh, in the Worldwide Web Conference. So if there, is, there are anybody who has attended that conference, then there won't be much of new, new stuff here. So uh, to begin, our, begin my presentation, uh, I will first uh, briefly describe uh, the problem that we are trying to uh, solve here. Uh, we are trying to solve the problem of uh, extracting all possible uh, relations that exist between any entity pair uh, in a given corpus. So uh, this is a much more in the type of open, open information extraction uh, type of a task. And uh, we would ideally like to do this in, a supervised, uh, in, a, in an unsupervised manner. Because there are certain challenges that uh, one must address uh, when uh, solving uh, this problem. The first thing is that uh, you are given a corpus. It can be, a, for example, it can be a crawl text from the web, or it can be some corpus that, that, is, that is there for you. Uh, the pro main problem is that you don't know the types of relations that you want to extract beforehand. Because of that, it's kind of a difficult to uh, manually create a training data to, to, to train a supervised classifier, because you don't know what relations that you want to extract. And uh, also, the uh, also number of different relations that you want to extract is also a kind of a uh, unknown quantity in this problem. So that makes a, it's a bit of difficult if you're trying to train, a, for example, a multi-class classifier that requires a number of classes uh, to, be, to be identified in advance. And also, you, there are certain uh, variance problems that you must uh, address in this, uh, in this problem. First of all, the entities that you are interested in between which you want to extract relations, the, the, the names of the entities can be can have a lot of variance. You might have uh, uh, entities that have uh, aliases of names. That ca they can be abbreviations. They can be acronyms. And you need to consider these uh, factors into account. And also the relations that you are trying to extract here. For example, a particular relations like an acquisition relation between uh, two companies. There are more than one way that you can express that relation. There are different lexical patterns that you can use. You can say company X acquired company Y, or company X bought company Y, Y was purchased by X. There are different ways to express the same relations. So you need to find out a way to identify the different, for example, paraphrases of uh, relations that uh, describes the paraphrases of lexical patterns that describe the same relation. And also, uh, there can be more than one relationship between a given pair of, pair, pair of entities. For example, before two companies be, be, ha, got to an acquisition relationship, they might have a competitor relationship, or one can be a close uh, customer of the other. So you need to take into account these facts. So uh, before I go into the, the talk, I will uh, explain uh, the main idea of the work, uh, that is the duality between uh, semantic relations that we talk here. So 
uh, let me explain it using a concrete example. Let's say the, let's take the acquisition relationship between two companies. So uh, if you are asked to define the acquisition relationship, one, one approach you can take is you can list the different instances between which an acquisition relation holds. You can say acquisition is the relationship that exists between company pairs such as, for example, Microsoft and PowerSet, or between Google and YouTube, or you can go on saying Acrobat and uh, Macromedia. This is one way of explaining, ex one way of defining the acquisition relationship. You can also define the acquisition relationship by stating the properties that must be satisfied by that relationship. For example, you can say uh, there exists an acquisition relationship between two companies X and Y if in a, in a particular text you find the lexical pattern that says X acquired Y or X buys Y for a certain number of dollars. This is another way of expressing the same thing. There are names for these two types of definitions in classical AI literature. One is called extensional definition and the other one is called intentional definition. So the main point here is they are both defining the same thing, the acquisition relationship. So there exists a duality between the two types of definitions. So when there is a duality between two types of definitions, this can be easily exploited in a machine learning framework, for example, in a, in a, in a co-clustering algorithm or in a, a co-training framework in a semi-supervised fashion. So here we are, we are, we are proposing a co-clustering algorithm uh, that is based on this uh, duality property of a semantic relationship. If you have any questions, feel free to stop and interrupt and ask any, at any time. Uh, so uh, I will give an uh, overview of the proposed method first. So for example, say that you are, you are interested in ex extracting relationships from the web. So you have web and you do a crawling on the web and collect text. If you have a text corpus, then you can, you can ignore the crawling part and starts with the corpus. And the first thing what we do is we want to do this in a very efficient way and, a, and we don't want to go multiple passes through the corpus. So what we do is we process sentence by sentence. We split the corpus into sentences first and then run a part of speech tagger on that. And then uh, we run a noun phrase chunker. The idea of running a noun phrase chunker is to identify the potential candidate uh, entities. If you have an entity extractor, then you can use that instead of using the noun phrase chunker. But then again, your entity extractor should be able to identify various types of entities. Otherwise, you won't be able to extract the, the types of relations that you want to extract. So falling back to noun phrase chunker is a kind of a uh, fallproof uh, approach here. And the next thing what we do is we extract various uh, patterns uh, that uh, from the context in which two entities co-occur. Mainly we extract two types of uh, patterns. One are called lexical patterns and the other one is syntactic patterns. Basically we are extracting part of speech patterns here as syntactic patterns and we don't do uh, heavy dependency parsing. And next we build this matrix. And in this matrix uh, all the information about co-occurrences between uh, patterns and entity pairs are represented. So what this, in this matrix you have, uh, uh, in, in the rows you have entity pairs and in the columns you have lexical or syntactic patterns. The elements of this matrix indicate the number of times a particular entity pair occurs with a particular pattern. And then we perform sequential clue clustering on this algorithm. If you look at this matrix, you will see this, these, are the, these are the extensional definitions and these are the intentional definitions. And we perform sequential clue clustering algorithm on this to obtain entity pair clusters that are row clusters and uh, lexico-syntactic pattern clusters. Those are the column clusters. And uh, we also need to identify the different relationships extra represented by each cluster because we are doing it in an unsupervised fashion. We don't know what, what rep relations are represented by the clusters. To do that, we train a uh, L1 regularized uh, multi-class uh, logistic regression or a maximum entropy model to identify the, the salient uh, or the discriminative lexical patterns that represent a particular cluster. So this can be done in a self-supervised uh, manner. I will explain the steps uh, in, the, in the subsequent slides. So this is the outline of the, of the proposed method. And the first part that, uh, that must be addressed is the pattern extraction process. And for this, uh, what, we are, what we are doing is uh, we identify two entities uh, in a sentence and replace them by two markers X and Y. If there are more than two entities in a sentence, then we will repeat this process. And the first entity is marked by X and the second entity, the subsequent entity is marked by Y. 
and then we generate subsequences over lexical surface, form, surface forms as well as part of speech sequences and identify uh, various uh, patterns. So there are certain constraints in place uh, because we do not want to extract for example two entities that are very fur far further apart or if there are a lot of say contradictions or the negations uh, in between uh, the, the two entities. So there are certain, certain uh, things that, uh, that are in place and I will explain it using an example here. So if you take this, the, the context merger is software maker Adobe system acquisition of macromedia and we have the, the Adobe system and macromedia being chunked here and uh, we replace them by X and Y and then generate the subsequences and for example you will find lexical patterns such as acquisition of Y, software maker X acquisition of Y and, and also the corresponding uh, part of speech sequences. So these are the lexical and uh, syntactic patterns that we will be considering in this work. So these patterns express different types of uh, semantic relations between uh, two entities. And then uh, we create a matrix that contains both, uh, that represents the co-occurrences between entity pairs and patterns. To avoid noisy extractions, we select only the, the, the more frequent entity pairs and lexical patterns in this work and build this matrix. This is the one that I showed uh, you earlier. And then we perform a co-clustering on this matrix to identify the different semantic relations represented by the entity pairs and lexical patterns. So I will first uh, explain the, the outline of the algorithm and then I will show a concrete example of it. So the first thing what we do is in this matrix, in this algorithm uh, you are required to have a matrix that, is, that, is, that you want to co-cluster and, uh, and, and two uh, threshold values which we call row and column clustering thresholds. We do not need the number of clusters which cannot be defined in this task. And what we do is we first sort the rows and columns in this matrix uh, according to their total frequency. So this will give the more frequent uh, entity pairs and more frequent uh, lexical or syntactic patterns to the leftmost corner of the matrix. So this, this way you can identify the more generic or more canonical relationships in, uh, first. And then what we do is we iteratively uh, alternate between rows and columns and do the following. For example, if we take uh, rows in this case, we measure the similarity between the current row and the existing uh, row clusters. And if the maximum similarity between, the, between any, any row cluster and the current row is greater than our row clustering, our row clustering threshold, then we will simply assign that uh, pattern to that cluster. Otherwise, we will form a new cluster, new row cluster that only contains that pattern. So this is a very simple a sequential algorithm and it avoids all pairwise comparisons between uh, entity pairs or even between lexical patterns which can be quite costly. Uh, yeah. um, computations? Yeah. Yes, you can, you, can, you can have your own, your own favorite similarity computation here and currently we are using the cosine similarity. But that is, that is a, that, that can be, you can plug in any, any similarity measure that you would like to. And uh, we repeat this process until all rows and columns are clustered. And we'll, we return the, the final set of row and column clusters. So I will show an uh, example of this, uh, of this working of this algorithm. So here we have a matrix. Uh, we have uh, four entity pairs and uh, five uh, lexical patterns. And the frequencies are indicated in the, in the elements here. And uh, we have set the row and column clustering threshold to 0 0.5 in this example. So the first thing what we do is we take the, the frequency, the total frequency of all rows and sort according to the descending order. So the rows are now sorted and now we go ahead and look at the columns and we take the, the total frequency of each column and then we uh, sort them as well. Now we have rows and columns sorted. So we, will, we, can, we can, this is, this is optional, we will first start with the first row. So uh, currently we do not have any row clusters to compare. So the first row becomes a cluster by itself. So we indicate a cluster using the, the square brackets here. And then we look at the first column and try to compare it with the existing uh, column clusters. We do not have column clusters at the moment. So the first column becomes a cluster by itself. And once again we come and take the second row and we compare it with the existing uh, row cluster and if you use the cosine similarity in this case you will get a value of 0 0.067 which is less than our uh, threshold value. 
So we will not merge it with the first uh, cluster. Instead, we will form a new cluster by itself. And once again, we take the, the next uh, column cluster, column uh, vector, and compare it with the existing uh, uh, column cluster. And uh, the similarity is uh, zero, so we will not merge it. Instead, we will form another uh, column cluster. So I think you will get the point now. So we, we, we go this, we continue this process uh, iteratively. We compare with two, and now we have a threshold greater than uh, 0 0.5, values greater than 0 0.5. So we'll merge it into the second column cluster. And uh, we take the next column and compare it with the existing column clusters. And there's another merger here. And finally, we take the last uh, row and compare it with the existing two row clusters. And we have a similarity greater than 0 0.5. We assign it there. And we don't have any more row, rows to cluster. We have two columns to be clustered. We take the, the third column here. And once again, we measure similarity and assign to the first one. And in the final, finally, we don't, because we don't have any more row cluster, rows left, we will once again fall back to the columns. And we will compare the last column with the two existing column clusters. And we'll assign to them. So you always start comparing with the left most or most column, because you yeah. could have multiple clusters which you have threshold, like you have similarity part, part yeah. larger than yeah. threshold. Yeah. No, what we find is we find the, ma the, the maximum similarity. Oh, okay. So, okay. Yeah. so you do compare with those. Yes, we, we compare with all existing uh, columns or row clusters and take the one that matches most. Okay. So it is a hard clustering algorithm. So we'll only assign a particular entity pair or uh, column to a particular cluster. So you can have a soft uh, clustering versions of this. For example, you can say, that instead of assigning to the, to the maximum cluster, the most similar cluster, you have a say another threshold set up. If our threshold, if our similarity value is greater than 0 0.9, then we will assign this lexical pattern to all such clusters. So you can have a soft assignment of lexical patterns by doing that. Now, currently, we are only considering the hard clustering uh, uh, setup. And now we have uh, we have identified the two two uh, row clusters and two column clusters, and uh, for example, the first uh, row cluster represents an uh, acquisition relationship in this case, and the second one represents the CEO of a particular company, being the CEO of a particular company, and then we have the corresponding uh, lexical pattern clusters. And also the values of the, of, the, of the vectors will indicate the correspondence between entity pair and column clusters. And there are certain interesting properties of this algorithm. First of all, it's a greedy algorithm, and it avoids all pairwise comparisons by being greedy. So it is, uh, and it alternates between rows and columns. So this factor is important because uh, once you have identified, we have merged a particular row, pair of rows, then that, that effect will be immediately reflected in the next uh, iteration in the column clustering and vice versa. So you don't have to wait until you have, you have clustered all the rows to get the benefit of row clustering in the column clustering threshold or vice versa. So that's the, that's the idea of alternating between rows and columns. And the complexity is mainly dominated by the, the initial sorting step. Initially, we, we did this row and column sort, sorting. And if you have, say, the, the maximum, the, the larger of rows and columns, number of rows and columns, if you, if you take it as n, then the sorting will be mainly dominated by n log n complexity. And, and because we did the sorting at the first, we get the more common relations being clustered first. And uh, the more noisy or more, uh, more rare relations get attached to these otherwise clean clusters at the end. So if you want to, for example, avoid, uh, if you want to have a very pure set of very big clusters, then you can avoid uh, clustering after a certain, certain step. So you can have a kind of hierarchical version of this. And we don't need to input, uh, input the, the, the number of clusters, row clusters or column clusters, which are required by most co-clustering algorithms. And instead, we need to, to tune uh, two uh, threshold values here. So as you have seen, seen in this example, the, the two threshold values, setting the two threshold values is quite an important task in this algorithm. And they are the only, only uh, tuning, tunable parameters here. So uh, we, have, we have certain uh, options uh, that we can take to uh, set the, the thresholds. So first of all, uh, it is important to note that uh, ideally, we would like to represent a particular semantic relationship using a particular lexical pattern or an entity pair cluster. So you should ideally have 
the number of clusters produced equal to the number of different relationships that exist, be, exist in your corpus. However, the latter that you do not know, so you cannot have an estimate on this one. So, uh, there are certain things that you can do, for example, if you have training data and annotated data for, for certain relationships in your, in your data set, then you can use that data set as a cross validation data set and do a, do a kind of a uh, parameter tuning using that data. That is, if you have some annotated data, and also if your data set is quite large, then annotating would not be possible, even, even annotated part would might not be possible. And also doing a kind of a cross validation with different parameter values will also be quite, uh, quite, a, quite a computationally uh, difficult task. And if you, if you, if you do want to do this in a very unsupervised manner, we can, we can have a kind of educated guess on the, on the threshold values using the simulator distribution. So the exact computation is in the paper, so I will briefly describe the, the main idea. So uh, what we do is we measure the similarity between all data points. We do not have to measure the similarity between all data points, but, but for, the, for, the, for the sake of uh, argument, let's, let's uh, assume that we, we measure the similarity between all data points that we want to cluster and we have the similarity distribution. And uh, because there will not be, I mean in, in large data sets there will not be lot of data points that have a high similarity. So you will have lot of data points with, with zero or very small similarity values and it will, it will, uh, it will uh, exponentially reduce. So we model this problem as a, this, the distribution as a zeta distribution like the, like the zip, zip uh, law in uh, frequency, word frequencies. Um, stat statistically speaking, it's a, it's, a, it's a zeta distribution, and uh, we try to measure the, uh, the, the the mean of this distribution. So, in the ideal uh, clustering scenario, the similarity between two clusters should be zero. Your cluster should be quite different. This should, should be apart. And uh, if you if you measure the, the entire similarity between the distribution, so it should it should co be computed only using the intra-cluster similarity, the, only only using the data points that that belong to those particular cluster. And uh, the way that we did the clustering, we have a threshold, and if we we will only assign a data point into a cluster if the if the if the similarity is greater than that threshold. So on average, we have an assumption here. On average, the 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 lower bound of the similarity in a cluster should be greater than the threshold. So this is an assumption here, and uh, we use this lower bound. We compute this lower bound using the similarity distribution. And, uh, and, and use it as an approximation of the theta, the, the threshold values. So here, as you have seen, that uh, there can be a lot of, there can be a lot of uh, approximation errors here. First, first of all, the distribution might not be, uh, uh, not be a very clean uh, zeta distribution. And also, we, we do not want to compare all the data points to compute this distribution. If you, if you compare all the data points, then that is n squared pairwise, pairwise comparisons. So if you are doing the pairwise comparison, then might as well you can do the clustering as well, right? So you don't want to do that. So instead, what we do is we we can find out the data points that have the threshold similarity between between less than a certain certain, certain value. That can be done by approximate matching algorithms. You don't have to do the all comparisons, and uh, and we can use that as an estimation estimation point of the zeta distribution. So that's how we can we, we do this. And for example, if you want to do an approximate matching, if you want to find all the instances in a database that have similarity, say less than 0.1 with your query, then you can do that. You can do that very easily. If you, you, for example, if you are using cosine similarity, then you know the number of elements that should match with your query, and you can only search for those queries and do a joint on the distribution on the database. There are a lot of work on approximate uh, string matching or, or in, a, in databases, so you can use that type of work here. So this is the basic, basic idea, and this can be done if you don't want to do the if you don't want to do the supervised uh, tuning. And then we need to uh, then we need an experiment to evaluate the set of clusters. And evaluating a large number of clusters can be quite a difficult task in itself. You can ask human to annotate the labels, but that's quite tedious, and there are a lot of lot of uh, uh, disagreements between what this cluster represents. So we we, we instead did then. Uh, indirect evaluation of the clusters by using those clusters for a different task. So the task that we used here was to measure relational similarity between entity pairs, and this uh, comes from our, uh, in our in our last year's World Wide Web paper. We presented uh, a method to measure relational similarity between two pairs of uh, entities using a set of clusters. So we use this approach. Basically, what we do is uh, we we represent a pair of entities, in this case the entity pair A and B, uh, using a feature vector F, 
where each, di uh, where each dimension of this feature vector represents uh, a cluster. So, the, so the, all the lexical patterns that belong to a certain cluster get their values accumulated and they become a particular feature in this cluster. So, the number of the dimensions of the vector is equal to the number of clusters that you have. So, that is how we represent each, uh, each, uh, uh, each entity pair. So, that will give you an indication of say uh, kind of a distribution of uh, the different relationships that exist between the two entities uh, in your clusters. And then we measure the Mahalanobius distance between two data points and it, can, it is defined uh, using this Mahalanobius distance measure. And uh, as, the, as the Mahalanobius matrix, we use, we approximate it by uh, the, 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 inter, uh, the, in, uh, the in, uh, intercluster uh, covariance matrix. So we have a set of clusters, so we can measure the covariance between clusters and we take the inverse of the covariance matrix and use it as the Mahalanobius matrix here. And for example, if you, if you set this matrix to be the, 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 the unit matrix, then you will have the, the known Euclidean distance. So it's a, it's a natural extension of the Euclidean distance and it, will, it will accounts to the different uh, relationships that exist between entity pairs. And uh, we used uh, a data set, ENT data set, uh, which we proposed in the last year's worldwide web paper that contains five relation types and has 100 instances. Each, each relation have 20 instances, so it's a, it's a balanced data set. It has different relationships such as acquisition between companies and the headquarters of a company and, and the company itself and the different people who are experts on certain, certain fields, for example, Einstein is expert on physics or Gauss is an expert on mathematics or this type of uh, uh, expertise of different people and CEOs and uh, the different birthplaces of a person and, and, and the name and the place. And uh, the idea is uh, we measure the distance in this case, relational distance between uh, each, each of these entity pairs. So we have 100 instances. So for each entity pair in the data set, we measure the, the distance or similarity between that entity pair and the, the remaining 99 entity pairs and we rank the entity pairs according to the, according to the distance. So it's, you can view this as a relational retrieval process task where you search for a particular entity pair and you would like to have entity pairs that has the same relation ranked ahead of the others. And we take the first 10 results and do a, say you can have, a, this, this case is a kind of a k-nearest neighbor classification, you can have the, the first 10, uh, top 10 uh, ranked results and we use uh, average precision to uh, evaluate the ranking. So if your, if your relational distance measure is good, then it should rank uh, the more similar uh, entity pairs ahead of the others, so that will give you a better average precision score. So that's how we evaluate the, 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 the set of clusters. And there are different baselines here. The first one is VSM stands for vector space model. So we do not use the clusters, instead we use the patterns themselves, pattern frequencies, and we set this to the uh, uh, unit matrix. So we will have, a, uh, we will have the, uh, the, the normal, the, the, course, uh, the inner product between the two, uh, two vectors. And the next one stands for latent relational analysis. So here we perform a uh, singular value decomposition on this matrix and reduce the number of clusters. So it's a one-sided clustering and reduce uh, the number of uh, patterns. So it's a one-sided clustering and then use those set of uh, singular uh, the, the eigenvectors to represent an entity pair. EUC stands for the Euclidean distance. So in this case, uh, we will use the clusters. It's the same as in VSM. Uh, in the measure measuring of similarity is same as in VSM, but instead in VSM we use lexical patterns to represent entity pair. EUC, we use the clusters to represent entity pairs. So EUC does not assume the clusters to be uh, mutually uh, dependent. They can, they, EUC assumes all clusters to be mutually independent. So any benefit that uh, arises from accounting the, the covariances between clusters will not be captured by the EUC measure. And RELSEM is the, the, the one that we proposed last year. It's a, it's a supervised approach. Uh, I will briefly give an, give an introduction to that method. So here what we do is we first uh, obtain a set of clusters and then we train a supervised uh, classifier. Basically, uh, it's a uh, metric learning algorithm and it's, it's, it's basically using the information theoretic metric learning algorithm proposed in uh, ICML I think two, two years back. And this measure can learn a distance measure. Uh, it, it will learn the coefficient of the Mahalanobius matrix 
and compute and learn the distance metric from uh, training data. So this is a supervised approach. And the last one is a proposed method, which is not a supervised method, it's an unsupervised method and uses co-clustering and uses those clusters to represent the, uh, the distance between entity pairs. So a higher average precision co, average precision is between zero and one, so higher average precision co indicates a better ranking, which means a better uh, relational similarity measure. And we see for, uh, for most of the relations and in the overall average precision, we have, a, we have the highest value for the proposed method. We do have, uh, for example, RailSim and field methods, we have the, 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 the supervised approach doing better here. And uh, this is uh, mainly because it, for these two relationships, uh, we, we found the most number of lexical patterns for these two relationships. So they are very well represented. The data sparseness is not a problem, which is trying to, which is the co-clustering approach is trying to, trying to address here. So rather the supervised approach learns a weight. For example, when you say this, this lexical pattern exists, how, how, how well does it uh, represent the relation similarity between two entity pairs? It learns its weight. And this supervised supervision is not uh, available for the proposed method. So that's why we have uh, the supervised approach outperforming the proposed semi unsupervised method for these uh, two relationships. Actually, yeah. all the other unsupervised approaches yeah. are outperforming the proposed method in those two fields, right? It's not just that. Uh, uh, yes, right. so, yeah. But that's, you think, the reason is that. that yeah, so, so, yeah, so the, re the main reason here is that uh, for these two relationships, there are a lot of lexical patterns. So the so the clustering or the the the, the, the co-clustering is not quite beneficial in this case. Rather, it's trying to merge things that that should not be merged. Yeah. Is it also possible that um, for the field and well, specifically for the field one, yeah. you you would have as your entities not only named entities, you have a much wider lexical variation. Also, whereas birthplaces would be limited to, you know, not that your algorithm mm -hmm. knows that this is yeah. a city, yeah. but there is a limited number yes. of slots, even though many. Yes. Yeah. Um, whereas for field, yeah. and because you are taking as pairs mm -hmm. to consider all MPs, yeah. you know, with some restrictions that yeah. you have, you may also have, you know, that mm -hmm. part why you're doing less well than the other unsupervised approaches. Yeah. yeah that's uh, yeah, that, that can also be correct because uh, in the field relation we have things like uh, physics, mathematics, different fields, sociology, and, and the fields can then themselves be, be related as well. I mean, one field can be a, can be a part of another field. And uh, for example, natural language processing and say artificial intelligence, whether you take it as different things or the same thing. So these type of things are not being merged by the clustering algorithm as well. And they are not being properly handled by an entity, extra, entity tagger. These, these approaches use the entity tagger and entity taggers as well. I mean, these entity taggers are not, not mainly trained to annotate these type of type the entities. That can also be a particular reason, yes. Yes, I need to, I need to look into that whether to check whether that's the case. And, uh, and then the, and the next, next thing that we, we are interested in doing is to identify the relations represented by the clusters. So you, okay, you have a set of clusters and they, these can be used for a particular task, at least measure similarity. But what are these clusters represent? So uh, to do that, uh, we can, for example, label each cluster with a lexical pattern uh, selected from that cluster. I mean, using lexical, we have lexical and syntactic patterns, but um, syntactic patterns can be very ambiguous and <coughs> they can represent various type of relations. So we, we, are, we, are, we could ideally use, <coughs> use lexical patterns to label a cluster. But to do this, we don't have any training data, so we need to do it in a, in a kind of unsupervised way. So what we do here is we have entity, uh, we, use, we once again look at the, the duality property. So we have entity pair clusters, the, the row clusters in our, in our matrix, and we assign pseudo labels to these clusters. So these can be just cluster one or cluster two. You don't have to have the relationship that you want to annotate. So we, we assign uh, uh, pseudo labels to these clusters. And then we assume that each entity pair cluster represents a different semantic relation. And then we propagate this label to all entity pairs that belong to that cluster. So this is a hard clustering framework. So a particular entity pair will only belong to a certain cluster. So we assume we assign all the, all the entity pairs in a particular cluster that particular label. And then we represent an entity pair using the, the row vector of, uh, in the matrix. For example, the Google YouTube uh, pair will have 
lexical patterns for example x acquired by 10 times and this type of information. So we have a feature vector for label, pseudo labeled data and then we train a discriminative model that uh, try to uh, ident that try to uh, find the discriminative the, 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 the Musalian features in a, in a particular class. So here we use uh, L1 regularization because that will give you a sparse model and set lot of weights to 0. So you only need to find the to look at it, look at a very small set of features for a particular class and then we simply select the, the largest the highest weighted uh, lexical pattern in, in, that, in, that, uh, in that model. So this process can be done without using training data and that is how we uh, label the clusters. And then uh, we compare this uh, use, uh, against a, an IV baseline approach where you simply select without doing anything complicated you simply select the most frequent lexical pattern in that cluster. So that is how I mean this kind of majority based labeling which is, which is quite, quite a popular, popular approach. And we then asked three uh, human judges to evaluate the, the set of labels produced by the, the two approaches and give uh, for assign uh, uh, grades. So the grade A is assigned if the baseline is better, the, baseline, the, the, the lexical pattern selected by the baseline approach is much more representative than the discriminative self supervised uh, training al algorithm. And B is a proposed method is better, C is both equal again, and D both, both methods performed bad. And for this task, we easily outperform the, the baseline algorithm which simply assigns the, the, the lexical patterns that are more frequent and these tend to be more frequent lexical patterns tend to be very, very generic ones. So they do not actually for example x and y or x or y or x of y. So these type of lexical patterns or they are very frequent and just select, get selected in the baseline but they do not represent for example an acquisition relationship. So uh, that is the, that's the main reason uh, uh, by the baseline is not performing well here. Yeah. Yeah. So, you have these generic patterns that are more frequent. Yeah. Going back to the baseline algorithm, yeah. if you are first start clustering with more frequent patterns, yeah. don't you have this problem of clustering uh, instances that share generic patterns yeah. and that, are, that should be actually yeah. clustered? Well, but, but the thing is like for example a pattern like X and Y, it can have a very high frequency yeah. and it can represent different uh, types of relations. So, in a it, it, in, a, in a soft clustering framework, it should not be a problem because if it is a, if it is a very ambiguous relationship, yeah. then it will get, it should be assigned to say three or four or all the all the uh, the cluster all the relation the clusters that you want to have. However, in our approach, we have a hard clustering algorithm, so that that particular all the generic relations, which have the highest similarity, will get get into one cluster at the, at the initially at, at the start. And, uh, and this, the, 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 the more, free, more, more less frequent relations will get to different clusters. So we have a very generic cluster yeah. that, that contains these type of patterns right. which, can, which can represent uh, different types of relations. Right. So that is one problem of the hard clustering uh, framework. Ideally you should do a soft clustering uh, fr framework to cover these type of issues I think. Yeah, or do you think after you do this, yeah. you re resort. Yeah. And we run the clustering uh -huh. algorithm because uh -huh. now you know which yeah. lexical patterns are more. Yes, yeah, that that is also possible. But like we we, we wanted to avoid like going in a in a, in a iterative fashion. We, I mean, we did we wanted to finish it in one sequential pass for 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 the efficiency of uh, computation. But maybe yeah. So you can, for example, do things like uh, like um, for example, in the in the in the Expresso algorithm. For example, right. you can use the set of class the, the lexical patterns and then do another iteration over those patterns. I mean you can do you can have a bootstrapping type of extension for this type of work but here we are not doing that I mean we are, we are just focusing on the on the one sequence of one sequential pass of the data set and basically, basically we are our, our goal is to process a large data set like in, in the as in the web relations so that's I mean we don't want to even go through the data through the corpus twice we want to do it in one sequential pass everything Last one, birthplace. In fact, both back uh, is the highest. Ah, yes, yeah, <laughs> and, yes. And I, so yeah. For that, I wonder what what kind of labels. That's that's is it my my uh, coloring is problem. Yeah. <laughs> what 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 labels is it coming up with for birthplace? What labels? Uh, for example, you have things like uh, X born in Y type of relations. Yeah. 
you have the I think yeah in the in the paper there uh, we have shown a table that contains the the, real, the labels and I don't have the the slides here. Yes, I need to color this one <laughs> instead of this one. <laughs> well, yeah. So the, both both systems are doing bad for that. Yeah. Huh? Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes. And uh, and uh, we did an experiment uh, using the open IE data set. Uh, that has been published uh, for this type of work. But this is a very small data set, only contains 500 sentences. So you can do things like, uh, uh, like the iterative things on this. I mean, it, you, don't need, you don't need to, to process this data set using this particular algorithm. So uh, this data set has uh, 500 sentences and contains four relation types. And uh, on this data set, we extracted uh, 947 lexical patterns and 384 syntactic patterns. So the, as you can see, the syntactic patterns are, number of syntactic patterns are less than the lexical patterns because a particular syntactic pattern can kind of subsume more than one lexical pattern. So that's the, that's the reason for the lower number of lexical syntactic patterns compared to lexical patterns. And the co-clustering algorithm produces four row clusters and 14 column clusters with the threshold estimated using the method that I described earlier. And uh, and the first three approaches are previously proposed uh, methods, which can uses, for example, uh, the naive base classifier. It's a, this is a conditional random fields uh, based approach, and this one stands for uh, Markov logic networks. And uh, what is interesting to see here is, for example, if you use only lexical patterns in the proposed method, you get a higher precision but a lower recall. And if you only use syntactic patterns in the matrix, you get better recall but poor uh, precision and the overall F score is somewhere around 0 0.8. So this is some, something that uh, you might, I mean, you might expect because syntactic patterns are very general and have a better coverage, so they can, they can have a, have a they, they have a higher recall. Whereas lexical patterns are very specific and they only extract that particular instance and they have a higher precision. But unfortunately using both didn't outperform the, the for example, the outperform the precision for the, for only when, when you only use lexical patterns in this case. So this is a kind of a, I mean, disheartening moment. I mean, ideally, you would like to, like to take the take the both uh, benefits of both approaches in the in, when you merge things. But what thing? But but uh, but I mean, but uh, but uh, post analysis into the into the the, the classification results uh, uh, showed that, uh, for example, the syntactic patterns themselves try to generalize more than they should do. Like for example, I mean, certain syntactic patterns like so I mean, x now noun phrase. Uh, conjunction and Y type of, of, of patterns, they can, they can represent a lot of things. So syntactic patterns are not the best way to abstract uh, a lexical pattern. So you should rather have a more, more uh, coarse level uh, abstraction rather than going, to the, uh, going to all the way to the, the syntax, syntactic uh, variation. For example, you can use a hierarchy of, say, for example, like WordNet or a, or a different hierarchy of uh, con concepts. And you can, for example, uh, use that to abstract the lexical patterns rather than going to syntactic level. So we need to, uh, we, uh, we are currently looking at uh, the ways that you can use such an uh, ontology to abstract uh, lexical patterns. Could you also uh, combine lexical and syntactic in a different way where you um, systematically yeah. take a combination of lexicalized and so, so that you yeah. have acquisition, yeah. well, so that you would have yeah. Noun and then of yes. instead of yeah. you know a yes. proposition. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, is, that is that is also possible. I think yes. Think closer to yeah. what you want without yes. having to put yes. on top. Yes, and and yeah, another another thing that uh, that might help that I in, in my point is to have a different weights for different things. For example, I mean, if the syntactic patterns are not helping well in doing, improving precision, then you should when, and and the thing is like. For example, syntactic patterns tend to get match more, more number of times compared to lexical patterns because they can match with more than one lexical pattern. So when you create a feature vector, typically the syntactic patterns have higher feature values compared to lexical patterns. Lexical patterns either occur once or, or they don't occur at all. So when you just measure, say, for example, cosine similarity, then the syntactic patterns at the end of the day get a, get a better, uh, better effect, right? So you should ideally have, a, say, a, some kind of a discounting weight for syntactic patterns. And I mean, I don't want to assign that discounting fa uh, factor just by assigning a score manually. You'd ideally like to learn that discounting factor from the data as well. 
But then again, this is unsupervised fashion, uh, uh, framework, and you don't want, we don't have training data to know whether syntactic patterns or exit patterns are doing well. So that's uh, that's one thing that uh, that might also help. Yeah. Um, so these five hundred sentences each contain an example of one of those four relation types. Yes. There are no sentences that don't contain such no. a relation type. So that's why, because you didn't preset it to to expect four row tests. This yes. is what came out. But yeah. That is a function of this data set exactly. That is yes, and okay. this the value is estimated using the the similar distribution that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. So ideally, you have very clean four clusters. I guess that's the reason that you get a get a get a proper estimate for this data set. Yeah. Row clusters. Sorry. At the precision. Yes. On the, on the yeah. row clusters. Yeah. Not on the column. No, not on the This data set only contains like entity entities, the entity pairs. So you have to do the evaluation on that piece. And uh, and I mean, ideally, you don't want to evaluate it on a 500 uh, sentence data set. You want to apply it into a much larger data set. So we we use the uh, social network system uh, and try to uh, to classify the relationships that exist between people in, in a social network. So here, uh, this is called spicy.jp. It is online, and it's a, it's a social network system in Japan, quite popularly used this, this. And you can register yourself. If you register your name, the system will crawl for your name and identify your colleagues and your friends and automatically assign to your social network. And it, it, it does it in a very, very efficient way. So you, you can get a lot of uh, like interesting. You can, it also shows the, the network structure. You can, you can uh, traverse over the network and find your friends and do all things that you want to do. So what we did was we selected, uh, and it has a large number of uh, this, the, the number of nodes, the different people, and the number of relationships, edges. And uh, what we did was we selected uh, 50,000 edges randomly from this uh, data set. And uh, we, had, we have the, the, the crawled web text data that the, the algorithm, this, uh, in, this uh, social network extraction mining uh, system uses to, uh, to extract information about the friends. So we do have the, the, the crawled text for these uh, entities. And uh, we uh, we manually classified using we first write certain several set of rules and then uh, use the uh, use those rules to classify uh, the uh, the edges in this network. So we identified uh, around say 53 uh, different uh, uh, relation types in this network. And uh, when you perform the co-clustering, you get uh, 11,000 uh, no, uh, 664 entity pair clusters for 11,000 uh, odd uh, lexical pattern clusters. And uh, we don't have syntactic patterns. We didn't run the syntactic tagger on this data set uh, for this, uh, for this uh, data set. Wait, this is the lexical yes, so we have, uh, for a pair of entities, we have the search results returned by Google for the, for the, for the, pair, for the entity pair, for their co-occurrences. We, the, we have the entire, entire page, yes, web page we have here. Yes, we have snippets as well. The, the document. The document. <coughs> around the top, yes, around like top hundred. We didn't go beyond that. Yes, yeah. Top hundred you can easily extract by using one query. So that's the reason for hundred. Right, and then so you look for patterns which contain two names. Two yes. Of these names yeah. So you, look yeah. Before and then so you can breathe the matrix, and after that is the same uh, the algorithm. And here we don't have a baseline, so we can't compare directly. So what we but the idea of this table is to show that uh, for different relationships that you typically find in social networks, you have, you have identified them with, uh, with, uh, with usable uh, performance level. And we have the micro and, uh, micro and macro uh, average uh, performance scores for the, for the data set. So this, yeah. Brother and sister look sort of roughly comparable in difficulty, but husband and wife don't. <laughs> and I'm just wondering why that would be the case. Yeah, no Sorry? symmetric relation. Yeah, no, it looks like brother and sister are identified with more or less. Well, in Japanese, it's not the same. In, in <laughs> yeah, Japanese, like is. brother relation is not, I mean, um, but brother, you can have elder brother and younger brother kind of thing. No, but, but brother and sister seem to ah, be right. preferably comparable in level yeah. of difficulty, whereas husband and wife are not. Ah, husband looks much easier. Yeah, that's. 
that's also kind of complicated, I guess. I mean, you, some people so register their previous wives and previous husbands, and uh, yes. I mean, we have not we have not gone into detail of this all 53 different classes and and what makes them different. So it's a mainly mainly it's a, of a kind of a scalability type of experiment. Three classes, of course, are uh, relations. Yeah. Relations are and so that's the result of clustering, right? No, no. This is this is manually manual classification for the for the to uh, to compute the precision recall and F score. Oh, okay, you need yeah, okay, the okay, gold standard. How? Oh, but you only the classifies them to 664 different clusters. Right. So there are more than one cluster for certain relations, and uh, the full 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 analysis in the, the paper. So we have. You don't uh, uh, we, we identify all the 53 relationships as well. Right. So how do you map these 664 clusters yeah. into the 53? Yes. So so we have 664 clusters, mm -hmm. and we have a uh, we have we, we have assigned we have we have uh, what we do is here. Uh, if you know the B cubed uh, measure, uh, that that does not require you to to, to assign uh, labels to the clusters. So each cluster you compare against the all all 53, and then for the for the for the best alignment you compute the precision recall and F scores. So there can be I mean there are insist more than more than one cluster that represents a particular relationship. Yeah. I'm surprised like uh, for like any random pair of people in social network actually get a web page that contains some tests. Uh, not, not necessarily. This, this is not any random uh, random people. They are they are they are people either identified by the, the mining algorithm, or you register your your friends or colleagues uh, in the in the system. So they are not these fifty thousand means uh, these are fifty thousand random edges. These are not fifty thousand random nodes. So the each each edge is determined either either by either you can specify your friends or the system will the, the social network will uh, assign a relationship. The lexical patterns. Yeah. Like it's surprising that you can discover lexical patterns for yeah. even even for, for social network people. Yeah. yeah. Like yes, brothers like, and sisters. Yeah. And why there's like a web page described? Not not necessarily a web page. Like for example, the the system identifies the the mining algorithm uses the same same information to assign labels, right? In the social network. So if it, if it didn't have, say, a web page, for example, if, if, if there is no web page between A and B that says they are not, uh, they are not uh, say, brothers, then the social network mining algorithm will not have, not have created that particular edge. Because there is an edge, we have the web page to process. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and here there is an analysis on uh, how the two, we have two, two uh, clustering thresholds here. Am I going? Uh, two clustering thresholds. We have the row clustering threshold and the and the column clustering threshold. So we need to identify. I mean, we did a kind of experiments to see the behavior of these two. So here, what we simply did was we have this ENT data set which has hundred instances, and we did a cross validation on this data set. So this is a, this is this is uh, we use say one part of the data set and uh, set the threshold the, the the two threshold values phi and theta, the row and column clustering thresholds to certain values and perform clustering and then we get the set of clusters and then we use those clusters to do the, the relational uh, similarity experiment that I mentioned earlier. And we repeat this process for large number of pi and theta values so you get this nice uh, graph. So it's a kind of a mesh plot. So uh, here what, uh, what you can see for example is when you, when you change the phi values, the row clustering threshold for less, so small, for small theta values, you you almost the, the performance is almost uh, not not uh, not changing it's invariant that is because for for the smaller values of theta you anyway get very bad clusters i mean you get very very big huge clusters if the, the threshold is smaller so it's changing the the, the phi value does not uh, does not differentiate between these bad clusters and basically when you when you improve the when you increase the thresh theta value you get very precise but small clusters so uh, so the overall the overall uh, uh, accuracy increases, and in this data set we have the we have 100 entity pairs, but we don't have uh, variance of entities. So that's why uh, not much of benefit from the the, phi, the change of phi is observed in this case. 
So this is a kind of idea of the, of the, of the two threshold values for this particular data set. It can be quite different for a different data set. I mean, if you have a lot of variance of entities, then, then changing phi will also have different effect on the, on the data set. And this is a basically a, a, a comparison with uh, other co-clustering algorithms uh, that you can basically use for this type of task, but with different computational complexities. We have minimum squared distance algorithm and information theoretic co-clustering algorithm. And uh, this is on, once again on the spicy social network data set. And when you increase the, increase the number of instances that you need to cluster, uh, the dimensions of the metrics, naturally the, the, perform, the, 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 the time increases. And it's on the log scale, so we see around, say, two or four, four times uh, uh, benefit uh, by using the proposed sequential algorithm. This is only on only comparing the, 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 the speed. And uh, that concludes my talk, so I will briefly uh, wrap up the, the main points of the, of the talk. So what we did here was uh, we looked at the, the specific property of duality between semantic relations, which can be easily uh, modeled in a co-clustering algorithm. And uh, we used uh, lexical and syntactic patterns to represent the semantic relationship between a particular entity pair. And, uh, uh, by doing co-clustering, you get the benefit of clustering rows and as well as clustering columns and vice versa in the, in the clustering process. And the algorithm has, scales the n log n with the number of data points and n is the, is the larger of the pattern number of uh, rows or columns. And we use this, uh, we evaluated the, the proposed method in three different uh, tasks. One is to measure the relation similarity between entity pairs, basically using the clusters produced by the algorithm. And we also used it in an open information extraction task, which is small, but uh, it's kind of benchmark data. And uh, finally, we did a kind of a more, more, more large, used it in more large data sets to see whether it can be used in a, in a, in a real world systems. And uh, we used these to classify relations found in a social network system. So that concludes my talk, if there is any questions. Any additional questions? Are there anyone who does like things uh, related to like this type of uh, relation extraction? Okay. I would like to get the feedback of yours as well. Okay. Well, we'll get a chance to talk later. Ah, yeah. Yes, it's okay. a lot of people do right. in not many examples, no. but similar. <laughs> so, good question. So, for one of the tasks, you showed that the syntactic uh, patterns didn't help. Did you evaluate that on the other tasks? Uh, no, we only evaluated on that particular task. Can you go back yeah. to how you extracted this quite in the beginning, but how you extracted ah, the patterns. Part of speech tagger and the, the yeah. noun phrase chunk. Okay, but not named. You can use a named tagger as well if you have. Uh, so when you extract the next call, what's the tactic pattern? How do you know how much you extract from the sequence? Like where the pattern starts and when the pattern ends? But we, uh, we extract all patterns that contain the two entity tags. But like X acquisition of Y, yeah. there's some more yeah. content. Like yes. software make of Y, there's more content before yeah. software. Yeah. So how yeah. do you... Yeah. So yeah, we, we extract everything and take the, free, the, the most frequent one. So it's, we, we, have, we actually we are using what is called the prefix span algorithm. It's a, it's a subsequence mining algorithm. And it will, it will find the most frequent subsequences and, at the end. So we don't build the metrics until we have extracted everything. I see. So that is absolutely. But that only requires one pass over the sentence. And sentences are, I mean, particularly smaller than uh, documents. So you, we, don't, we don't extract patterns that go beyond sentence boundaries. Right. So the prefix span algorithm has certain, certain constraints. So it does not need to go beyond the sentence boundary to find the matches. But, but it's still pretty big, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. And, and, and uh, 
And uh, in the, the prefix plan algorithm, there are certain parameters that you can set. For example, you can set a minimum support. So the minimum support means how many number of different patterns that, that subsumes this particular pattern. So if the minimum support is less than a certain value, then you don't store that one. So that one. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an algorithm that's used for even larger data for, for like genes, fi finding common gene sequences, and uh, like market basket analysis, like where people who buy beer also buy, uh, uh, I don't know what's Edama in English, uh, you buy these type of associations. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a type of association rule mining algorithm. And it's, 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 it, can, it, it scales well, it, it, it does quite well. Try to restrict it to x and y that are in some dependency relation. We we didn't uh, run the de run the dependency parser on this data set, so we don't have dependency relations. And Tokyo do bio NLP yeah. on exactly that. Yes, I mean. And then you you'd allow yeah. things that are farther apart. Yeah. Because right now, what is your maximum length? Uh, so the, I think we uh, we have around the LE set to I think uh, six tokens. I don't quite remember yeah, they are in the ESCN. Yeah. So I mean, you, the thing is like, that's also a, whether you want to try in a dependency parser is also a case between the efficiency and the accuracy of the parser. I mean, we are, we are trying to process web data. And uh, they can be noisy and they don't have particular punctuation and there are a lot of unknown words. So dependency, I mean, doing part of speech tagging itself poses a lot of problems. Like a lot of things are annotated. I mean, we first tried to use an entry tagger and it, 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 it goes and identify everything that starts with a capital letter S and company. So, and, and, and I don't know what will happen if you try to do a dependency passing on that sentence. And also the, the, the speed. I mean, the, the whole idea of the work was to, to do it quickly and do it efficiently. That's the idea of the sequential clustering as well. So we don't want to take so much time on the parsing and, and the clustering is much more efficient than parsing. I mean, I don't know what, what would the, the benefit be. If you have your domain specified, for example, if you have biomedical texts, then you can do certain things. For example, you can start with identifying, defining the types of relations that you want to extract, whether you want to extract poor proteins or uh, the, the, the diseases caused by a particular protein. Then you can do it in a supervised fashion as well. Can you try to do a lot of scale data? Web scale data. At the beginning of the talk, you mentioned yeah. you're going to do a lot of So the largest what we have used this is uh, uh, is data set on the on the social network. So, so the experiment you mentioned. Yeah. We haven't used it in a, in a large data. Uh, uh, you know, if you look at like identity pairs of the uh, web, it's very often that two entities don't have a clear relationship. Yeah. Maybe a very remote relationship or somehow yeah. random. Yeah. I wonder if your, I mean, if your algorithm yeah. applied to that situation. I mean, I mean um, here, here the, the the everything that that I mean there are there are two two there are two uh, main problems here. One is how you represent a, se a semantic relation, and the second one is how do you use that representation in the clustering framework. For example, whether you are using lexical patterns or whether you are using syntactic patterns whether you are using dependency patterns or you, you, you abstract your patterns in some way, or like whether you take, for example, second order co-occurrences. For example, if two, two entities do not appear in the particular page, but you have a particular entity that occurs with those two. So you, you can create a pattern with that as well. So that's, the, that's a representation problem. But in this case, we are, we are doing a very, very naive rep relation extraction. We only use at sentences that contains both those entities together. So this, this, might, this might not actually extract all the re different relationships between that. So, but then you have different, uh, for example, you can use co-reference to identify different instances of a relationship, in, in, instances of an entity in a particular document. So not necessarily if you have the two entities in a particular sentence, but you have a co-reference for another, in, another mention of that entity in a, in a sentence. So you can use this type of information if you have. But that's the, that's the, that's the relation representation problem. And once you have the representation, there's another problem of identification of the different relations. So you need to, need to, to separate the two things and, and think. I mean, the, 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 the sequence of clustering part, you can use, if you, even if it is not, not, uh, not uh, like textual data, you can use it for, uh, say, gene clustering, or you can use it for 
market basket analysis, or you can use it for different purposes. And we have a patent for that. Okay, well, thank, you. Yeah, right, thank you.